In this Poker Physics video, you'll see a variety of simulations of electrostatic boundary value problems. We're interested in solving Laplace's equation in Cartesian, cylindrical, and spherical coordinates using the separation of variables technique. Essentially, the procedure consists of seeking solutions to Laplace's equation that satisfy the given boundary conditions. By the uniqueness theorem, we're guaranteed that once we have found a solution that satisfies those boundary conditions, we have found the one and only solution. In the following, the strength of the electrostatic potential is indicated by color with yellow indicating high voltage and blue indicating low voltage. In the first set of simulations, we investigate the electrostatic potential inside of a very long hollow conducting pipe of rectangular cross section. We assume the pipe is so long that end effects can be ignored and the problem is effectively two dimensional. All terms in the solution will be the product of some function of x and some function of y. We'll call the width of the pipe A and the height B. This problem is solved using Fourier series and solving for the coefficients such that the boundary conditions are satisfied. Initially, all four sides are grounded, and hence the electrostatic potential is zero throughout the pipe. In the following, we'll assume that there are narrow insulating strips separating each of the four sides. Let's set the top plate equal to V0 and see how the electrostatic potential is altered inside of the pipe. The solution is an infinite series composed of terms of the form of the coefficient times the product of a hyperbolic sine of some coefficient times y and sine of some coefficient times x. By making a shrewd choice of the coefficient that appears in the argument of the sine function, we can force all terms to vanish at x equals a. Sine function guarantees that all functions will automatically vanish at x equals zero. Hyperbolic sine guarantees that the function will vanish at y equals zero, but not at y equals b. We see similar behavior if the voltage V0 is applied to the left-hand side instead of the top. Only here the solution will be an infinite series of terms of the form of a product of a hyperbolic sine of some coefficient times a minus x and sine of some coefficient times y. Once again, by making a shrewd choice of the coefficient that appears in the argument of the sine function, we can force our solution to vanish at y equals b as well as at y equals zero. The hyperbolic sine function is now chosen such that the solution will vanish at x equals a, but does not vanish at x equals zero. Next, consider the case where both the left and right sides are at voltage V0, with the top and bottom sides grounded. One way of solving this problem is to first solve the problem of the pipe with the left-hand side set to V0, and then solving the problem of the pipe with the right-hand side set to V0, and then making use of the principle of superposition. Recall that the electrostatic potential as well as the electric field obey this principle. Essentially, the superposition principle enables one to add the solutions. If we add the boundary conditions of these two separate problems, we get the boundary conditions of the problem we are presently trying to solve. Thus, the interior solution of the left and right sides is set to V0, with the top and bottom sides grounded, is given by the sum of the solution of the pipe problem with only the left-hand side set to V0, and solution of the pipe problem with only the right-hand side set to V0. In the penultimate case in this set, three sides are set to V0 and the bottom side is grounded. One way of finding the solution is to use the superposition principle. In other words, finding the solution to only the left side set to V0, the solution to only the right side set to V0, and the solution to only the top side set to V0, and adding those three solutions. In the final case in this set, all four sides are set to V0 and the solution can once again be found by the superposition principle. Of course, it's completely unnecessary in this case to resort to infinite series. The uniqueness theorem guarantees that any solution of Laplace's equation to satisfy the bounding conditions is the one and only solution. 
Therefore, we can write down immediately that the potential is a constant V naught throughout the interior. Next, consider the set of simulations of the electrostatic potential inside of a very long cylindrical pipe. Once again, we assume that the end effects can be ignored and that the problem is essentially two-dimensional. The solution to Laplace's equation in cylindrical coordinates will be the, of the form of some function of the radius only and some function of phi only. In graduate level electromagnetism, pipes of finite length are treated, and this means that Bessel functions will appear in the solutions. Functions of the radius that are suitable would be a constant, natural log of the radius, radius to the mth power, and radius to the minus mth power. The angular part of the solution will have terms of the form sine of m phi and cosine of m phi. In this first case, we seek the solution of a pipe, the surface of which has been set to V-naught times sine of 2 phi. The only term that survives with the infinite number of terms in this expansion will be the sine 2 phi term. Therefore, our solution will be of the form of some coefficient determined from the boundary conditions times sine s squared, where s is the radius, times sine of 2 phi. Because of the factor of 2 in the argument of the sine function, we expect there to be two sections of identical form as we travel from 0 to 2 pi. The maximum voltage v not in this system appears on the surface at the angles pi over 4 and at 5 pi over 4. And the minimum voltage in this system, minus v naught, appears on the system at the angles 3 pi over 4 and 7 pi over 4. We next consider a pipe that has surface charge density of the form sigma cosine 3 phi. We see that there are three distinct sections. The maximum voltage occurs on the surface at angles phi equals 0, phi equals 2 pi over 3, and phi equals 4 pi over 3. The minimum voltage occurs on the surface at the angles pi over 3, pi, and 5 pi over 3. The solution to this problem will be of the form of s cubed times cosine 3 phi. Boundary conditions in this case that we'd apply is a discontinuity in the electric field between the interior and the exterior solutions is equal to the surface charge density divided by epsilon naught. The next simulation, which is, illustrates the boundary value problem of the top surface set to V-naught and the bottom set, surface set to minus V-naught. It's a little bit more difficult to solve than the previous two problems, and the solution will be comprised of an infinite number of terms rather than a single term. The midplane of the potential is an average of the potential on the upper surface and the bottom surface, and in this case, the average will be zero. We next turn our attention to boundary value problems that are solved in spherical coordinates. In undergraduate electromagnetism, we limit our focus to problems that exhibit azimuthal symmetry. That is, the electrostatic potential will depend only on the radial coordinate r and the polar coordinate theta. The solution will be in the form of a series comprised of Legendre polynomials times some power of r. In the first case, we treat the problem of a grounded conducting sphere in the presence of an otherwise uniform electric field, which we'll call E0. We expect the effect of the sphere to be noticeable only in the vicinity of the sphere. The electric field lines are represented by purple lines, and for clarity, only lines from one plane are plotted. Viewed from a distance, we see how little the electric field is distorted by the presence of the sphere.
Closer up, we see that the electric field lines impinge normally on the surface of the spherical conductor. In addition, some of the field lines don't terminate or emanate from the surface of the sphere. Nevertheless, these field lines are also bent in the vicinity of the sphere. The electric field inside the sphere vanishes, as is the case for every conductor in an electrostatic field. So we only need to concern ourselves with the exterior solution. Solution is applied by finding the boundary conditions that the potential goes as minus E naught R cosine theta as R goes to infinity, and that the potential vanished on the surface of the sphere since the sphere is grounded. Only two terms survive out of an infinite possible number of terms, and the solution is E naught R cosine theta times r cubed, where r is the radius of the sphere, over r cubed, where r is the radius at which the potential is being evaluated, minus 1. In the next case, we treat the case of a sphere, the surface of which has been set to some linear combination of the zeroth order Legendre polynomial and the second order Legendre polynomial. Since we're given the surface charge density here, rather than the potential, the boundary condition we apply is that there is a discontinuity in the electric field, the discontinuity being the surface charge density over epsilon naught. In the final case, we treat the case of a sphere, the top half of which is at potential V0 and the bottom half of which is at potential minus V0. Again, we cut the sphere in half in order to see inside. A few simulations ago, we looked at the potential due to a very long cylindrical pipe, the top half of which was at V0 and the bottom half of which was at minus V0. Just as with that boundary value problem, the cylindrical will be of the form of a series of an infinite number of terms. Notice the similarity in how the potential changes from top to bottom.